music. Welcome to M Squared TechCast, a live internet radio show offering the latest news Hello. and interviews with the people driving business, <laughs> technology, and politics in Michigan. Now, oh. your hosts, Matt Rausch and Mike Brennan. Hey, it's Mike Brennan. And, and it's Matt Rausch. Matt, and he's back. Back from being under the knife. Yes. That's it. Thank goodness. Well, we've got a great show uh, lined up for you today. We've got uh, stuff that'll make you smile, stuff that'll scare the crap out of you, um, uh, and everything in between. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna start off the show with some good stuff from our uh, longtime friend of the show, Kathleen Norton Shock. She's gonna talk to us about her podcast, uh, Diva Tech Talk, which is all about women in technology, and also her other pet passion, the Michigan Council of Women in Technology. So, Kathleen, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, guys. Always good to hear your voices, and nice to hear you sounding so chipper, Matt. <laughs> um, I'm glad you're doing better. Yeah. So, so what's new great, with Diva? Te- what's great. What's the latest with Diva Tech Talk? Yeah, Diva Tech Talk is rocking right along. Uh, by the end of this year, we'll have done 19 podcasts this year, which mm. you know averages out to be about one and a half a month. And as you guys know, we um, we're sort of podcasters to go, and uh, this is part of our volunteer work. So I'm always pleased um, that we didn't get that many done, considering that this is, you know, not certainly not our careers for my co-founder, Nicole Scheffler, and I. Mm -hmm. Um, But this is uh, we had a really good recent one um, that came out in between the last time I spoke to you and now. And that was Liz Armbruster, who is the senior vice president of a company called Avalara. Uh, She was our episode 93. Liz has got a good story. She was originally pre-med as an undergraduate mm. and uh, graduated with her bachelor's in molecular and cellular biology. But as, as we like to think sometimes, life had other plans for her. She decided immediately to get married and begin a family and decided not to go back to pre-med and wound up working instead in physicians' practices in sales and marketing. But she kept finding herself drawn to the administration side. Uh, and then to the application side of physicians. So she migrated over to Zilog, and, of course, we've all heard of that company. It's a legendary competitor to Intel, um, and worked there for about eight years doing quite a few exciting things, left there as a vice president, and moved to a company called Ubiquity, which is hard to say, which is a content distribution technology company that was eventually acquired by Amdoc. Uh, And she left there as their vice president of procurement and operations. Um, And frankly, she left there because she was raising her family at this point was in their teenage years. And she kept finding herself on the road all the time and said, you know what? I need to achieve some balance, which is something we hear a lot from both men and women. You know, as we're all progressing in our careers, we hear this a lot that it's important. Right. So. Then she moved over to this company called Avalara, which I had never heard of, but was founded in 2004. It's headquartered in Seattle, and it went public in 2018. So it it was a startup that continued to be private for 14 years. Mm. It's a global company, and it's focused on getting businesses of all sizes all over the world proficient at getting their tax compliance right which uh, is fascinating, and it does it all in the cloud, right? So she's now their senior vice president, and many of the um, many of the lessons that she gave in her podcast had to do with, uh, as she co- calls it, reframing your possibilities, right? Never just sitting one place in life and continuing to look around at what is intellectually satisfying and, and interesting to you. She also has some great mentoring lessons. Her kids are now in college, and uh, she does a lot of mentoring. Um, So she talks a lot about what she talks about when she's talking to young women or even other middle-aged women who might want to move into a technology field um, about taking a look at, you know, and constantly reevaluating their own talents and predilections. Um, And obviously, she's a great champion of balance. Also, inside Avalara, as many companies who are getting smarter about this uh, are doing, 
um, she is, there's a very strong push toward diversity and inclusion. And next year, we may podcast Amelia Ransom, also from Avalara, who is charged with doing nothing but making sure that the company continues to stay cutting edge in terms of diversity and inclusion so they can continue to be profitable. <clears throat> so Liz is the champion of the women of Avalara, Avalara's employee resource group, which, again, if you know anything about DI, that is a big movement inside most companies. Cisco started it years ago. Many bigger companies like Salesforce have had ERGs for years. Um, but it's important that companies the size of Avalara do that too. So she is the champion for women of Avalara, and they sit on every continent because it's a global company and talk about women's issues. So that was a really good episode. It went out just before Thanksgiving. And then this coming week, um, we'll be doing a Janine Heck, who is the vice president of artificial intelligence products for a little company called Comcast. Hmm. Um, and Janine, uh, Janine, I did that particular podcast, and I loved meeting Janine. Um, she got her bachelor's in engineering from the University of Penn, which, of course, also houses Wharton. So in her undergraduate years, she had the benefit of not only getting a technology-oriented undergraduate degree, but she was able to take general business courses at the Wharton campus inside the University of Penn. Uh, and then she moved to New York and worked for six years at a company called Gemini Systems, which was acquired by Essex Tech about four or five years ago, working exclusively on Wall Street, exclusively serving the New York Stock Exchange, first as a programmer, then as a business analyst. And she did some really interesting revolutionary things in those days, and it would have been revolutionary in the early 2000s. She she and her team created a Java-based visual system that allowed for oversight for trading anomalies, trading anomalies. And considering that most traders are human beings, right, um, back in those days, there wasn't as much oversight as there would be now. But she found that she wasn't that interested in the finance world. So she jumped back into school, went to Columbia for her MBA, and got two internships, one at Google, which was okay, but the other one at NBC. And when she went to NBC, while well, she, she kept wanting to go back into the software side, and she actually was in marketing, uh, under her internship, she did find her niche, which is streaming media companies. Um, and so she started to make some strong, very uh, focused decisions. And one was that she wanted to work in a company like that. And so she found Comcast many years ago now, like 14 years ago. And the reason she chose Comcast was twofold. One, because it's headquartered in Philadelphia, and she wanted to go back toward her family. But probably more importantly, she characterizes Comcast as of all the media companies having what she calls the most humble environment. She, In fact, she describes it in the podcast as, you know, we're just a whole bunch of wor walking, uh, working sticks, you know, trying to do the right things for our customers. We don't have all of this angst. There isn't this much. Uh, there isn't that much arrogance, and and that's what she was finding among the other media companies, at least at that point in her life. So she went on board with Comcast, um, and it went straight up through the ranks, and is now their vice president of artificial intelligence. And mm. the one thing that is a little bit of a, a a downer for her occasionally is that she runs a team of seventy people. She loves that. She loves running the team. She loves sharing her experience. She loves learning from what she calls some brilliant people. But there are days when she has to control herself because she would like to jump in, right, and go hands-on to projects. And instead, as you know, when you lead teams that lead other teams, you need to often do hands-off and do mentoring. She's raising four children at the same time she's doing all of these things. Um, and Comcast themselves it seems to be doing some very exciting things. She gave us some hints about that in the podcast, what they're doing in the whole AI side. And on the side, besides raising the four children and running <laughs> artificial intelligence for Comcast and this team of people who are, again, you know, all over the world, because Comcast itself is global, she's also doing mentoring for technology uh, students at two high schools, one of whom was her own alma mater, St. Hubert's in, in uh, Philly. So that was a really cool podcast, and that will be coming out the end of this week, so look for it. And then finally, at the end of the year, Nicole and I always do a podcast just one a year with just the two of us on the podcast. And I think we'll probably publish this the first week of January. But what we typically do, and I think this will not change this year, is we look back on the 18 to 19 podcasts we did during the year, 
and say, okay, here are the trends that we see. Here are the biggest themes that seem to be common to all of these very bright women at all ages and stages of their careers. And then because Nicole is doing a lot of strategy planning for Cisco, which is her company, and because, of course, I come out of years ago a think tank environment and, and have run some companies and I'm always trying to look at the future, we will probably also do our own little little Diva Tech Talk predictions for 2020. Uh, that will okay. be a combination of what we <clears> see <throat> as the top five or six hot technologies and business trends and how that will affect women, right? Um, actually, everyone, but women in particular. So we'll be weaving that together with women in tech. So that's kind of what's going on with Diva Tech Talk. Would you guys like me to segue over to Michigan Council of Women in Technology? Yep, we've got about three or four minutes left in this segment. Three, I'm told. Three. Okay, so MCWT, as usual, is very busy. We did a physical move uh, from Epitech, where they, they were housing the MCWT office, to Technosoft. Both of them are diamond sponsors of MCWT, and, and they've given us office space at Technosoft, which is in Southfield. And that will be, that's pretty exciting, but it takes some time, of course, to do that move. Uh, we raised $500,000 from the November MCWT ball. And as you know, we do many, many, many programs uh, during the year. Then that will be part of what will uh, what we'll, uh, pay for those. Um, we have a website contest in full swing right now for 300 middle school and high school girls on about 50 teams. The finals for that website contest will be on January 11th, and sponsors for the website contest are Ally Bank, Amerisher, and Accenture. Um, and as I think I've mentioned to you guys before, if you go into programs on the MCWT website, we also have some great tools to help other young girls do website programming. And then finally, our university scholarship program is also in full swing. As you know, we've given away $1.3 million in scholarships uh, since 2006, and so no applications are open for uh, scholarships for the 2020-2021 university season. Uh, they opened October 1st, but they and the ability to apply runs through January 31st. So anybody wants to go to our website, www.mcwt.org, go under university, and you can go to that page and all of the requirements. You just need to live in state and be pursuing a tech degree either on an, a university level or a postgraduate level. And you are probably eligible if you have a GPA of 3.0 and above and you are a woman. <laughs> okay. So our website for Diva Tech Talk, it's www.divatechtalk.com. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. And for MCWT, it's www.mcwt.org. Okay. All right, where are those website finals going to be? Uh, this year, January I don't 11th. know. Our, uh, I, last year, <clears throat> um, I think they were at Blue Cross Blue Shield. They may be at Ally, um, but I'll probably be on your program, I would think, right beforehand, or I can get you guys a link. Yeah. Um, uh, because the finals, uh, they are open to the public. So lots of parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles come to see their girls in action, and, of course, we have – our judges from not only our, our those three sponsors, but many of our other. We have 110 sponsors right now for MCWT, right? Mm. So maybe 20 of those companies will have judges at the event. So um, I'm not sure exactly. It'll be someplace in southeast Michigan, and I'm not sure that we've chosen it yet, but I'll certainly let you know. All right. Once again, that's mcwt.org and divatechtalk.com, correct? Kathleen? Oh, I think we just lost Kathleen. Well, anyway, Kathleen Norton Schock with Diva Tech Talk and the Michigan Council of Women in Technology. It's been great to have you on the show. We will talk to you again next month. We'll be right back in a moment with another uh, se- uh, with another segment of the uh, M Squared Techcast. You can do it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's been a few weeks. What can I say? Out of practice. Yeah, yes. right. <laughs> For right now, it's Matt Roush and Mike Grennan. And you're listening to the M Squared Techcast at podcastdetroit.com. 
Lawrence Technological University is all about opportunities. Okay. You learn beyond okay. the campus, oh, doing real-world okay. research for top companies and honing your skills <laughs> through co-ops and internships. Apply what you learn. Be challenged. Be more. Oh, yeah. At LTU, yeah, no possible is well, everything. Salaries yeah. of Lawrence Tech grads are among so, the highest so. of any university in America. CEO? Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors, faculty, and coaches. Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. As a Lawrence Technological University graduate, you're not only marketable, you're worth more. Yes, more. According to Payscale.com, when it comes to graduate salaries, LTU is in America's top 100. Be invaluable. Be more. At LTU, possible is everything. Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors, faculty, and coaches. Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. Hey, it's Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And we're back with another segment of the M Squared TechCast. And we have our regular guest with us this afternoon. He was going to be in studio, but he's a little bit under the weather. So we're going to talk to him on the phone from a safe distance. Yes, keep you at arm's length, yes. Richard. <laughs> it is Richard Steenen, uh, CEO of IT Harvest and cybersecurity expert. Richard, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much. And more like death warmed over than <laughs> under the weather. Ah, okay. Yes. Well, well, what what Mike has uh, written down here for our for our show notes for you is uh, topics to turn your hair white. Well, mine a lot of mine already is white. And mine too. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, even even whiter, I guess. Ter- topics to turn the last few white. Uh, what what do you have for us this month? What's the latest and greatest? Um, yeah. So one interesting thing, if you're in business is to worry about various privacy legislation that's being passed. Mm -hmm. Um, And the first to fall here in the United States is California's, the California um, CCPA, California Consumer Privacy Act. Mm -hmm. And uh, it goes into effect January 1st. Uh, It has a long history of, uh, it had been, uh, put out there and then tabled by one party or the other. And then an activist uh, threatened to, ha- well, he had enough signatures to put it on a referendum. Mm. And there's big issues in California. Once something's on a referendum, you can't amend the act until without, without having another referendum, which is very expensive and cumbersome and uh, not the representative government way. So they just, the legislation in California just passed it last year. Um, they just said, let's just throw something together quick. And they got the guy who was organizing the grassroots campaign to, to uh, pull out. And so they got something on the books, which goes in effect January 1st. And it is unclear what it intends to do and how it's going to be enforced. <laughs> um, it is modeled slightly after the uh, General Data Protection Act in uh, the EU, it luckily has some carve out. So most of us don't have to worry about it. If you have to be a business that is uh, over 25 million in revenue um, Mm. or has half your revenue come from uh, selling consumer data. So if you were a marketing data company, you'd you'd worry about this. Uh, But for the rest of us, yeah, Not 25 million is a tough threshold, so uh, we're well under that. Yeah. I was going to say, Mike, Mike, you're you're approaching yeah. that, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, 25 million. Yeah, you'll be there next year, so you should hire an attorney, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so what is this? So, what is what is this act going to require people to do? So it basically, it's uh, make uh, a good effort to secure data, and so it's a little nebulous, mm. um, but probably better than. GDPR, which says you will use state-of-the-art security, which yeah. is more nebulous, but uh, a little harder to prove that you're doing. Um, and there'll be fines up to $700 per incident. So if mm. you lost a thousand records or had them breached or they were stolen from you or whatever, um, you'd be liable for $700,000 in fines. Mm. So it can add up very, very quickly. And it goes, so you have to be compliant with this in three weeks, <laughs> but nobody the, the knows law, what that means, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the law requires the attorney general of, of California to 
you know, define how it's going to be enforced and what the criteria are going to be and all this, all the things that you usually expect from a new regulation to be spelled out. Um, but it gives us the attorney general until the end of June to publish that. But it also authorizes hmm. him to enforce the act July 1st. So he could easily produce a whole bunch of requirements uh, in the end of, at the end of June and file a bunch of suits and uh, in, uh, actions the very next day. Hmm. So people are scrambling. They're trying to you know, line up and know that they're okay, I guess, uh, for a regulation that can be very nasty. Um, obviously, we know how this works. The state attorney general is going to go after the big guys, and they've, they've got Google, Facebook, Apple. Um, those are big ones. And enough of you know, they've got those to look at and huge fines associated uh, that they could apply to those if they're in violation of this. Basically, you, do, you know, when you collect data, you've got to say what the collection purpose is for, and then you have to allow, uh, similar to GDPR, uh, allow a consumer to say, hey, I don't want you to have my data. Uh, please remove it. Uh, but that alone is a very difficult process for my years at uh, Blanco Technology. I know it's uh, erasing data is not as simple as you think. You can't just, you know, uh, delete a file. Uh, the data is all over the place. Um, so it's pretty, and, and besides that, you have to prove that you deleted it. And that, that alone needs a whole data management solution that's got to be overlaid on top of everything that you're doing already. Well, hmm. you got to wonder with Facebook, I've lost track of how many billions of accounts they have. What a fine that could be, huh? Yeah, yeah, and they're they're already seeing enforcement actions in uh, in Europe. Hmm. Well, it sounds like <clears throat> making best efforts. Nobody knows what that is until a court tells you what it is. Somebody's going to have to sue or be sued to to get the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It reminds me of uh, there was a pretty critical uh, landmark case against uh, um, uh, Comerica here in the in in Michigan. And the, you know, so a woman who had had all of her money stolen from her account and Comerica argued that, well, it wasn't her fault. You know, she let somebody steal her username and password. Um, she went to court and all came down to was Comerica following best practices. And so expert witnesses came in, et cetera. And yet they had to prove that what they were doing was at least as good as everybody else in the industry. Mm-hmm. So that's, but that takes years to right. determine. And it's just as you don't want to get into the lawsuits and going into appeals over something like this because it's very expensive and time consuming. Absolutely. You also wanted to talk about a new book by, from Andy Greenberg of Wired called Sandworm. What's that all about? Yeah, Andy Greenberg, you know, came up from the ranks at uh, Forbes. As a matter of fact, he was my original editor. Oh. Uh, for my col columns at Forbes. And so he got into, you know, the security world probably 2008 time frame, and then he moved over to Wired, and now he's uh, he's a top senior editor there for technology and security. Mm. And he started tracking this group that arose out of the GRU, which is the Military Intelligence Unit mm -hmm. in Russia. Right. And... Um, and he tracked it. You know, it's, the story really begins with power outages in Ukraine, Christmas of 2015, mm -hmm. when, you know, about a third of Ukraine's power systems were shut down. Mm. And it was, you know, very effective. And I can use the word sophisticated, honestly, here, attack against your power grids that, that use, you know, basically gave the attacker the ability to log in as if they were the power grid controller and literally shut off circuits, which they would do. Mm. And they, as people brought them back online, these guys still had controls, so they shut them off again. Uh, and finally, you know, we've been waiting for an attack like that for a decade, right? Because people, even in 2000, um, the uh, defense agencies had run an experiment to see if you could do that to a power generator and demonstrated that, yeah, they, they could. And there's a film you can see on, on YouTube if you can find it under uh, Project Aurora. Um, and you see this big, huge diesel generator basically start rattling around and smoking and 
uh, totally destroying its bearings because of the <laughs> attack over the wires. Hmm. So it took, you know, from 2000 to 2015 for there to be an example of that happening in the wild, and it occurred against Ukraine. Hmm. And it's always been frustrating to me. I always predicted, you know, this is going to happen. And when it does, the U.S. power grid is going to say, yeah, but that was, you know, country X. That will never happen here. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what happened. The, there was no, oh, my God, the sky is falling. We have to revamp our security across the board. Um, nothing, you know, no increased <clears> spending, <throat> nothing. It took about, I think, 15 months for the White House to acknowledge that the attack on the grid had happened and that it could happen here. Um, there were ancillary reports that the exact same attackers, Sandworm, had infiltrated most of the U.S. power grid and used some of the same software, um, not to do damage necessarily, but obviously we're, we're uh, scoping out and doing reconnaissance on U.S. power grid systems. Mm-hmm. Um, and, that, and then two year, a year later, another power grid attack using even more sophisticated methodologies uh, occurred in, in Ukraine. And then, of course, the you know the biggest attack in history uh, measured in losses was uh, the famous Not Petya attack, and Andy Greenberg you know, probably made his name writing that article up, uh, where he talks about the destruction at uh, the container shipping company Maersk mm-hmm. in uh, Amsterdam, mm-hmm. and that attack started with a single infected machine on Maersk's network uh, in Odessa and spread to the entire Merck network around the world uh, in a matter of uh, hours, mm-hmm. very, very short time frame, and basically uh, destroyed all those systems that it infected, just wiped their disks completely. And uh, Merck was down for about 10 days. Mm-hmm. And the uh, chairman of the board went to Davos and revealed that, you know, it cost them $250 million in downtime. But the damage just spread throughout the world because it shut down the container shipping facilities that were controlled, about six of them around the world. And, you know, there were reports of, of uh, uh, trucks not being able to get checked in because the barcode scanners wouldn't work and they couldn't do anything. And so there were lines of trucks at the shipping facilities that were miles long. Hmm. And everybody was scrambling, you know, especially with their perishable goods, to find another shipper. Yeah. You know, without their computer systems, they couldn't ship. So much so, for just-in-time delivery, yes. Exactly. Yes. You know, yeah. when you rely on your supply chain to keep everything moving, uh, you've got to account for the fact that the supply chain might just stop. And that's exactly what happened. And we, So now we've seen what can happen. Shouldn't we be taking measures to prevent it from happening you know, again, and especially here. Yeah, absolutely. Got about two minutes left. Let's talk real quickly about your security yearbook of 2020 that you're coming out with. Yeah, your book. Plug your book, not somebody else's. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a good time to talk about it since it's uh, going to the printers today. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I finished the manuscript a week ago and it's been through editing and I had somebody add all the citations to the proper formats and now it's been typeset and all the artwork done. Um, so the printer's getting it today and then uh, so it should be in my warehouse by February 1st and then I can get it to the book launch at RSA on February 24th. So we're going to have a big launch and a book signing and all that good stuff. Um, I'll probably do something locally here in Michigan as well. Um, because I'm going to have thousands of hardcover books in a warehouse that I'll have to uh, figure out how to how to move as quickly as possible. All right. Can you get them online? Is that part of your plan? Yeah, yeah. You'll be able to get uh, an ebook version. It won't, you know, it'll be um, cumbersome to read, especially the directory portion. Uh, but uh, um, that will be available mid year. I'm going to do the classic publisher rollout hardcover first. Mm-hmm. And then soft cover and ebook at the same time, so that will roll out about the time that I'm uh, going to uh, to print again with next year's security yearbook. Yep. So it's a history of the IT security industry starting back in you know, roughly 1995 when Checkpoint Software got its big start mm-hmm. um, till now. So we've got a, a pretty close to a 25 year history, 
And and then every year there's a lot more history, you know, because this industry is growing at 24% a year. So yeah, absolutely. You know, so a lot happens every single year that has to be reported on. All right, and Richard. Let's website, have let's have the uh, your, website your, where your people book. can reach us. Yeah, yeah. Security-yearbook.com. And starting in January, that website will have all the updates that are happening in the year, so that it'll be easy for me to collate and uh, pontificate on those updates. Uh, at the end of the year. All right. Thanks very much, cybersecurity expert and CEO of IT Harvest, Richard Steen. And once again, that uh, website, security-yearbook.com. Thanks for being with us today. We'll be right back with another segment of the M Squared TechCast. For right now, it's Matt Rausch. And Mike Brennan. And you're listening to the M Squared TechCast at podcastdetroit.com. Lawrence Technological University graduates earn a degree and a higher starting salary. In fact, when it comes to earning potential, the Brookings Institution ranks LTU fifth among U.S. colleges and universities. Be enriched. Be more. At LTU, possible is everything. Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors, faculty, and coaches. Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. What do you get? At Lawrence Technological University, yeah. okay. everything. Yeah. Great labs yeah. and studios, supportive <laughs> professors, plus a full campus yeah, life, write it off. Yeah, he, 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 he and all write it the off. software okay. you need to succeed. Be smart, be more. Uh, At LTU, no. oh, possible my, uh, headphones is everything. Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors, faculty, and coaches. Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. Good. Hey. hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, jinx. All right. It's Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And we're back with another segment of the M Squared TechCast. And we have in studio, as you can see here, Dale Hermiller, who is CEO of Healthy Planet Holdings. Yes. And I met, uh, I just was telling Matt, uh, who has just returned from being out a month, uh, getting a, a new knee. Yes. At least, uh, I guess it is technically yeah, a new knee, completely new knee, right? knee. Yeah, yeah, complete replacement. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that I met uh, at Dale at uh, the Cannabis Leaders event in Lansing last Thursday. Okay. That was something that our, our guest host for the month that Matt was out, Rick Thompson, put on. And uh, we were waiting around for the bar to open, and he was standing there with his friend, and I said, heck, let's go downstairs and get a drink. <laughs> and then so we can begin to talk about what he does. And what he does is he's in the hemp industry, which, uh, you know, everybody is aware, I think, that we passed a law for recreational cannabis use, which took a year for it to come forward. And on December 1st, on a limited basis, there are a few provisioning centers. But everybody forgets there's also hemp farming, which then hemp is used to create CBDs, which is really a medicine. Right, Dale? Well, that's correct. And... If you want to go back and, and really look at the new industry that's forming here in America, you could almost go back to 1906 where mm. there were 6,000 different car manufacturers. Right. So over there was Henry Ford, David Buick, Barney Oldfield. It looks like Barney Oldfield, too. And so you get the picture. I mean, there were a lot of pioneers just gutting it out because they didn't know if they were going to have roads or gas stations or repair shops. Well, the same is true of this new industry, both cannabis and and hemp. Obviously, both of them have been restricted for almost 100 years, and we've pretty much now globally said, okay, based on all the studies, you know, there's plenty of scientific evidence that there's some good medicinally that can come out of this plant. Now, hemp and marijuana are related. They are a cousin. However, industrial hemp does not have any THC. Or a very small th amount, yeah, actually. Yeah, three-tenths of one percent. So you could get high on corn silk faster than you could hemp. <laughs> well, that's what Matt used to do when he was living over there on the yeah, west side on the, the west state, side of the so. state, sure, yeah. We had a lot of cornfields. Yeah, so, right. So anyway, but going back to the car industry analogy, we went from 6,000 manufacturers in 1906 down to less than 60 in 10 years' time. Hmm. So same thing has happened here on a much more accelerated basis. Hmm. 
in the cannabis side, it's now big, big business are coming oh, into our state. Big. I mean, we're talking B with billions, and they have their sights set on having a footprint across the entire country in every state that is eventually going to be legal. I think we have 11 states legal now, I believe, That's right? correct. Yeah, for recreational, right. Right, and most states now are certainly leaning towards m the medical side, and I'm sure with ballots coming up next year, it's going to be much more acceptable because as guys from our generation, when Harry Truman and Eisenhower were presidents when we were born, um, it was pretty much taboo to be talking about marijuana mm -hmm. or anything related to the devil weed when we were <laughs> growing up. It was up. for those hipster musicians and things Well, like yeah, that, I was going right, to say there's yeah. the old Jimmy Buffett lyric from Pencilton Mustache, only jazz musicians were smoking marijuana. Right, yeah. Right, <laughs> and, and, and so it's, it's clearly in my lifetime it's been extremely prohibited, restricted, regulated. Okay, so now... Having lived my whole life in automotive. Yeah, I was going to say, your background's automotive, so how did so you c get into this industry? You know what really did it is I learned that in Oakland County, there were over 175 grow facilities hmm. in 19 and 2016. Now, that's way before this recent legalization, so... I got checking into it, and I go, oh, those are just caregiver guys. What's a caregiver? Well, a caregiver can grow 12 plants for himself and then five other people, so he can grow 72 plants. Mm -hmm. And so now every warehouse in southeast Michigan has 72 plants. So I go, if they can do it, I'm going to figure out a way. Well, then they legalized it, and so I – learned everything there was to know about it and did a little traveling out west. But I came back and I said, okay, as soon as they legalize hemp, this makes sense. Because, again, I grew up on a farm, and mm. I said, we import hemp from China, of all things. We import hemp. And here we are, the best agricultural community. Sure. Wor you know, country in the world. We could feed the whole world if if we had to. Yeah. So now all the farmers in America are allowed to grow hemp. What's that mean? I can barely spell it if you spot me the H, M, and the P. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of questions now, and what's lacking is a total th – there's a disconnect at the – consumer end on what is CBD uh -huh. because unfortunately I, I stood up late last night and counted. There's 34 million websites on the internets that sell CBD. Wow. And then another 34 million gas stations and now you can get it at Kroger and this, that and the other thing. So everybody is looking at CBD like it's some wonder drug. The, 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 the honest to goodness answer is it has to do with your cannabinoid system that's in your own body. Everybody knows we have neuroreceptors in our body. We, and when it comes to why is hemp a good, good thing, we have now learned that CBD can make and allow people to get off of their opiates and substitute CBD because the CBD will attach to that neural receptor that normally they were looking for an opioid, and it's replaced by CBD. CBD has uh, anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. properties. So having heard from Matt today about his knee surgery, I've given him a <laughs> patented... Uh, CBD product, and, and this is critical because I, I kid about getting your $3 can of CBD at the gas station because 
don't do that. <laughs> it's like gas station sushi. Pass, like, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. And, and don't buy don't buy vape cartridges from your friend that sells them to you for seven for a hundred and it says dank cartridges on yeah, it. Don't yeah. be stupid. Yeah, yeah right, right, right. So anyway, the, the, the great thing about the <laughs> hemp industry is um, it's a wide open playing field. Right. And but the farmers had nowhere to go. There was no one place you go and say, oh, great and wonderful Oz, what should we do? So we created our own little group, and it's called the Michigan Hemp Cooperative. Mm -hmm. So most farmers, most hemp people in the state of Michigan are a, a member of this group. And so collectively, we're looking at the supply chain and the problems in it. And long and the short of it is, this year we had problems for our farmers because there was no grain elevators, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. In the you know, we have to have a place to, to sell. It. Well, to yeah. dry it, bucket, sell, you know, put it into the machine sure. that turns it into oil. Mm -hmm. So, picture if you would, we went out and grew twelve tons of of uh, hemp, and we only had capacity to convert about two million mm. into oil. Mm -hmm. So then we're looking all over the rest of the country for extraction capacity. Right. There's no room at the end. Mm. And so that's what our little group is attempting to do is to build that giant grain elevator. Um, we're going to do it in Jackson, mm -hmm. right in the uh, center of the south central Michigan. So if you drew a 150-mile radius, we'll hit Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio. So it's we, we're... And again, the reason why we're, we're going to make this work is that it's not just one guy. It's not one big giant corporation. It's a, it's a handful, it's a couple hands full of hemp pioneers that have gotten their fingers dirty this year and know what we did right and what we did wrong and how we can fix this in the, in, in for the longer term, even to, to get some of the hemp that's stored in barns into our extraction facility so we can turn it into CBD. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the last thing I want to touch on is, again, stay away from that gas station CBD. Take a look at uh, crafthempcompany.com. Now, this is a, uh, a store that we put together that only stocks Michigan-made CBD products. So everything in this store was made by Mr. and Mrs. Smith or Frank down the road or Louie up the street, and they're good at certain products. They may have, uh, one guy might be really good at topicals. Another guy has the pain ointment. Uh, one of my friends has the, uh, the patented pill. You, you, you got to try the pill. The pill. But anyway, I'm excited. I'm excited about the business. And uh, where else can you go to be a pioneer again, just like mm -hmm. 1906? That's right, Henry Ford, all over again. We got about two minutes left, so let's uh, give folks some information about where they can go to find out more from you guys. Give some website addresses and whatnot. Well, I would I would definitely have you check Craft uh, Hemp Company, because again, check out you know, the products that were handmade here in Michigan. The other thing I'd have you guys and gals consider is that we're not going to be able to build the hemp industry waiting on government or some big company like Monsanto to come here and save us. We're going to need to, to do some good old-fashioned farmer co-ops. And mm. so... As you're talking to your financial advisors and you're going to and ask them, well, am I going to get a 30% return again in 2020 as I did this year in the stock market? Maybe I should put a couple bucks into hemp. Mm -hmm. And I know you're going to find those amongst your financial advisors and uh, help the farmers and uh, help yourself. Absolutely. Sounds great. All right, thanks very much, Dale Hermiller, CEO of Healthy Planet Holdings. And once again, the website, crafthempcompany.com. Thanks yes. for being here today. Thank you, guys. All right. We'll be right back. And for right now, it's Matt Rausch. 
and Mike Brennan. And you're listening to the M Squared TechCast at podcastdetroit.com. Lawrence Technological University is all about opportunities. You learn beyond the campus, doing real-world research for top companies and honing your skills through co-ops and internships. Apply what you learn. Be challenged. Be more. At LTU, possible is everything. Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors, oh, we faculty, and coaches. Right? Yeah, Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. Oh, thank you. Lawrence Technological University graduates oh, earn a degree and a higher starting salary. In fact, when it comes to earning potential, the you Brookings Institution six, ranks LTU fifth runs, among Texas U.S. colleges and universities. Be enriched. Now be more. We, uh, at LTU, possible is everything. Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors, faculty, and coaches. Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. What do you get at Lawrence Technological University? Everything. Great labs and studios, supportive professors, plus a full campus life, NAIA athletics, and all the software you need to succeed. Be smart. Be more. At LTU, possible is everything. Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors, faculty, and coaches. Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. As a Lawrence Technological University graduate, you're not only marketable, you're worth more. Yes, more. According to Payscale.com, when it comes to graduate salaries, LTU is in America's top 100. Be invaluable. Be more. At LTU, possible is everything. Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors, faculty, and coaches. Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. Hey, it's Mike Brennan. And Matt Roush. And you're watching M Squared TechCast, actually MI Tech News TV, now that we're in video. And so we're Matt is back with us again, our Indeed. regular co-host. We had Rick Thompson in last month filling in. So we're back to tech, and speaking of tech, we have Greg Doyle from Oakland County, and uh, I'm not sure, I, I know, uh, what's your actual title for Tech 248? So, uh, Are you the uh, manager, or yeah, what? Yeah, so probably actually, got about I, four titles, yes. actually. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I've maybe seen your business card, one, it's like, you know, you know three feet yeah. long, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so really, my main responsibility in economic development is in the entrepreneurial services side. Right. So officially, it's, I manage the one-stop shop business center okay it's a mouthful right? right and you know just part of our responsibility is this initiative called tech 248 so this is one of the things i do in addition to my daytime job well let's talk a little bit about this maybe the first time folks have heard of tech 248 i know from previous times you've been on the show and, and whatnot there is something in the neighborhood of 4,000 tech companies in oakland county of which about half of them are small operations and then the rest of course are bigger operations yeah yeah so when you look at just small business in general in Oakland County, there's a huge, huge number. Um, but as it relates to Tech 248, we really want to scope it to tech companies. And these are like digital media companies, IT mm -hmm. companies, kind of your traditional. And uh, when we looked at that, oh, the numbers are pretty astounding. Like, right. like you mentioned, 4,000. Um, but, you know, really almost all of them are classified as small businesses. So uh -huh. they'd be 100 employees or under. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just a huge number in comparison to other counties across the state. So we really wanted to do something to help bolster that, help connect that uh, that group of people together. And that's Tech 248. Okay. So what services and uh, programs do you offer? So really, so really Tech 248 is a, it's a network. And the main objectives of this network, the very first one and the most important, is just to help connect people. Because mm -hmm. we had all of these stories of these little tech companies. You, know, you hear a story where, hey, you know, I got this big deal. It was a little bit too large for me. I had to outsource part of it, so I outsourced it to this company in California. And then they come to find out, you know, four months later that the California company outsourced it to a company that was one floor above them here in Oakland County. Mm. Wow, so Grand Circus. We there. just had lots of stories like that. So even though they're in the tech industry, this kind of personal connection was really a big thing. So the big uh, activity is really meetups and trying to get people networking and together. And get Letting to people know that other companies exist that can help yeah. them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yep. I think the most interesting thing about the tech companies in Oakland County is how diverse they are in what they do 
and that their customer base is typically outside of the region. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. have a lot of these small companies. I think you guys have interviewed a number of them where you get this story that they're doing business with Disney or with <laughs> yeah. Microsoft or, or who ha whoever else out there. So um, from an economic development perspective, boy, that's that's tremendously valuable for Oakland County. So, so what's new with Tech 2? We probably should recap 2019. So Yeah, what, what, what's been the highlights of this year? Yeah, so 2019, you know, we had uh, 11 events. So uh, we typically skip uh, December, um, but we did have an event this uh, past uh, week over at Centropolis. I bet oh, you, you yeah. know Centropolis, oh, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, we've heard of that just a little bit. Yeah, yeah that's that's at Lawrence Technological University in Southfield. Where's my bell? Shameless plug. Oh, ding, bell. ding, ding. ding. The shameless yeah. plug bell. We don't have one. <laughs> uh, but it's a, you know, as you know, it's a great new incubator accelerator yep. in Michigan, and we wanted to expose the network to that great resource. So we had over 90 people there. Mm. So that place was packed. It was standing room only. Uh, they got uh, to, to demonstrate what they do at the incubator. Hardware and, uh, accelerator. The hardware accelerator. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's that so is one thing that we noticed is that virtually all of the accelerators in the Detroit area, and there's some really great ones, but they almost all deal with software or apps. And what do we do here in the Detroit area? We make stuff. So we wanted yeah. an accelerator for people who are going to make stuff, make physical products. Sure. I think so. it's a great, it, it's it's really focused well. So and I'm excited about it. And we've had a number of those companies on the show, too. So. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure you will for years to come. Right. Yep. Um, there's just really some great capabilities there. And we've, of course, I mentioned earlier that my, you know, the crux of what I do is we work with entrepreneurs every day. So we've already sent probably three of the companies we work with over to Centropolis to talk mm -hmm. to. So mm. okay. uh, the opportunity to uh, to work with Centropolis to develop a prototype is, is just a great thing. So um, so 2019 for, um, for Tech 248 has really been a great year. We will. I don't have the exact number, but we're going to pass 2,000 in membership this really? year. Really? Mm. That many? Huh? So, so that's great. And another interesting thing is it's we're looking at the companies they're coming from. It's like 600 different companies. Hmm. So a uh, pretty wide variety of people doing different things that are part of that network. And we're still showing, you know, 80 to about 80 to 100 people showing up at each of these meetups that mm -hmm. happen. So, so it's it's been very healthy. One of the new things we did... Um, that I thought that you guys would be interested in is we're talking about connectivity. Um, we wanted to do something that was even more, what would be the right word? It would be more focused and even more local. Uh -huh. And so we've experimented with in 2019 this thing that we're calling entrepreneurial journeys. Uh -huh. And really uh, what it is is an opportunity for less experienced uh, IT or tech-related CEOs mm -hmm. to just do a Q&A, a facilitated session with a, a, another CEO that's had 10 or more years of experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you get that opportunity to ask, wh wh what were the bumps in the road mm -hmm. and how did you get over that? And yeah. so we scoped those really small. Uh, we partnered with a couple of uh, local co-working spaces to do those. And uh, we've had some really good results with that. So it's just uh, a really focused, let's talk CEO to CEO. Hmm. And so we'll continue that in 2020. So what are the opportunities for people to get involved with Tech 248? Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways to do that. So, I mean, of course, all you have to do is just go to tech248.com, uh, take a look around. You can register as a member. Um, that's the easiest, quickest thing to do. But there's opportunities to potentially speak as long as you're not just coming there to try and sell something. If you've got some technical expertise. That like the insurance salesman or somebody. Yeah, 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 yeah right. We don't yeah, <laughs> no, I don't think that's so. That's not going to work. That's well, Bob loves those guys, right? So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that yeah I never get any sales pitches in my job either, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. yeah right. That, you know, and when we formed Tech 248, that was one of the first things I said. We want to do these meetup things, but... Boy, we don't want it to turn into, you know, here's a new insurance policy that you could buy. So we're really careful about that. Um, but, you know, there's opportunities for uh, for people to be a guest speaker. There's mm -hmm. opportunities for companies to host. Mm -hmm. um, we've been to some really cool companies uh, over the years. Um, and, you know, there's opportunities as well. You know, people kind of think this Tech 248 thing runs on its own, mm -hmm. mm. guess what? I mean, we, one of the successes is that there's really a great group 
of volunteers uh, at cities and villages and townships mm -hmm. across Oakland County. Uh, some of the economic development people um, and entrepreneurs uh, that work together with us to help us find you know, a topic for a meetup, help us find a venue for a meetup. So there's a whole organizing committee and people can get involved in too if they want to do that. Plus you break it down by sort of regions within the county, right? Yeah. So we looked at, you know, if you look at how many businesses are and where they're located, mm -hmm. um, and you looked at the density, uh, we mapped that out and came up with five geographic districts mm -hmm. in Oakland County. So uh, we're organized around those districts and volunteers in those districts, and we try to move the events around to those districts uh, through the course of the year. Yeah, the uh, the needs and interests of a company in Holly are going to be different from those in Ferndale, right? So yeah, 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 right. And, yeah. you know, the types of companies out in Holly are pretty much going to be the one-man show. Yep. Um, but, boy, you know, that becomes really valuable for them, doesn't it? Because you're sitting up in Holly. Now, what better way to get connected to other bigger companies and people in your industry? Mm -hmm. Of the universe of companies that you have in Tech 248, what would you say by terms of uh, type of business it is and what they do, wh what are the biggest areas? I mean, software, for instance, would be one I imagine, right? Yeah, software, you know, traditional IT type uh, businesses. And mm -hmm. then there's a lot of digital media mm -hmm. companies. I mean, a lot. This is really... Uh, a, a focus. Uh, if you look across really the Midwest, this is one of the areas where these digital media or mark slash marketing companies right. are really strong here. Um, so, so are they do in video work, production, that kind of thing. Yeah, or what are they, you know, what are they it's, doing? it's for a website. It's the creative side. <coughs> it's uh, it's video work. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, companies that you guys know like uh, Vectorform and yeah. of them, yeah. you know uh, companies like that. So. Um, but we've got a lot of talent there in, in the area. So mm -hmm. th those would probably be the biggest makeup uh, of Tech 248 companies are in that. I wonder if that's the, the sort of new generation's version of all those industrial filmmakers we used to have here for the car companies. That's sort of the modern I, version know, of that. You know, I'll huh? tell you, if you can really kind of track the growth of these companies starting just before the, the real downturn mm -hmm. and the emergence of this cluster of these little digital media companies happening over the course of the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it's all coming from that. I mean, they mm -hmm. all had background. They didn't want to pack up and, and move away uh, from beautiful Oakland County. So <laughs> That's it, yeah. They, they started their own Well, the thing. weather's always sunny in 70, yeah. right? And, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, don't look out the door today. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But, you know, that, that brings up the other point of the, the diversification. So you've got, I think, a lot of them coming from that auto industry, suffering that downturn right. and saying, well, we don't want to go through that again. And they deliberately started to seek out other industries to provide service to. Of course, they appreciate, and a lot of them still do work with auto industry, but sure. it's not a dependent thing anymore. Mm -hmm. No. All right. Got about two minutes left, Dave. Uh, so, uh, what do you want to wrap with? I'll talk about maybe how people can reach out to you guys. And next maybe event, maybe yeah, the next event. Yeah, the yeah. next event. Would uh, be good. You know, the next event still I'm planning. Uh, it will. We, we're actually going to have two events in January. Uh, one out in Farmington at ACG, mm -hmm. um, and another one out in Pontiac at a place called PC Miracles. Mm -hmm. um, so. Right away, we're going to start with the bang. You know, January is going to have two events, right? Um, and then we're working on uh, February as well. And, and no auto show to compete with this year. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. They'll they'll be going. Well, we'll probably you know yeah, take June. off a month or two. Yeah. I'm waiting to see how they're going to. The exciting Auto Week it ties in with the Grand Prix. Yeah. Penske is yeah. behind all this, so be interesting. yeah. And, yeah, and I think basically, be great. they're, they're going to turn Hart Plaza into another showroom. You know, it's going to be yeah. a giant outdoor showroom, which hopefully it won't rain too much. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, everybody I've talked to is really positive on that yeah. idea. So yeah. I mean, it sounds great to me. I well, because we lost the German car companies last year, they didn't want to do it anymore, and I've been hearing rumors about GM wasn't all that keen on it anymore either. So. I mean, the events are tough. I mean, uh, that that was the thing to get. Sounds as though you speak from experience. Yeah. There, right? <laughs> uh, yeah so, tough. I mean, now it's all social media is how you get people together, not so much physically get them together. But still, you I mean, you got to see a car, touch the car, yeah, you know. Right. Sit in the car. Sit yeah. in the car, yeah, you right. know. I mean, there's still nothing like that face-to-face, -face, you know. Right. Um, but you're right. Things have changed. It's more difficult these days. Right. So um, I, I think Tech, uh, tech 248 is going to do a great 2020. Can't believe it's 2020. Yeah, yeah we're almost done with believe, the teens. Huh? It's the Roaring Twenties yeah. again. Yeah. All right. What's the website, Greg? 
uh, tech248.com. Okay. And you can go to Advantage Oakland, tech248.com, or you can just Google tech248.com and All you'll right. get there. Well, thanks very much, Greg Doyle of Tech 248. That's the Oakland County Tech Group. I want to thank Greg and all our guests today. We had Dale Hermiller, CEO of Healthy Planet Holdings. We had tech uh, cybersecurity expert Richard Steenan, and we started off the show with our longtime friend. I won't say the O word, Kathleen Norton yeah, Schock yeah, from MCWT and Diva <laughs> Tech Talk. We'll be back again uh, next Monday, and that'll be our final show of 2019. So yep. we might do kind of a little bit of a retrospective, but we'll have some guests too. Yep. Until then, it's Matt Rausch. And Mike Brennan. And you've been listening to the M Squared TechCast. On MI Tech News TV.